Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Spartan Center. I'm Patrick Varhu. For the first time ever being on this side, next to Colin Casey and Matt Rodalakis, uh, we're going to start today's show off with the madness of March, March Madness. Who do you guys have in your final four? Uh, I have Arizona, Villanova, UCLA, Kansas. Not really any uh, surprise teams there. We all the same thing, all three of us. Yep. So. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah. It's what happens in March. Good teams, they go far, and we all agree. So yeah. you, I think we'll have some disagreements here. Who do you guys have as some upsets? Uh, well, I have uh, Vanderbilt beating Gonzaga in the second round. I think they're actually struggling with a 16-seeded team that they're playing right now. Uh, also, US USC <coughs> just played their way in the uh, first four round. They beat, um, they beat Providence yesterday. They're playing SMU. I, think, I don't think SMU is that great of a team. I think USC could come out with the upset. Wow. Uh, I looked at Xavier and Maryland, 11-6 game. I think Xavier is a pretty good team. Trayvon Blewett, one of the best players in the country for sure. Maryland, they've been pretty cold recently, dropping a lot of games. So I think they're definitely open to an upset. I also have Middle Tennessee versus Minnesota, which is a 12-5. I think Middle Tennessee is just a very good team. They're underrated around the country. They had that run last year where they beat uh, – Michigan State in the first round, 15-2. That was crazy. That was crazy. Uh, but, yeah, Minnesota's a good team. I don't know if they're a five seed. And Middle Tennessee is a very good team, so I could easily see that happening. And my last one is VCU versus St. Mary's, which is a 10-7 game. And I think that VCU plays a style of basketball that is very difficult to combat. And I also think they're a pretty good team. And St. Mary's, uh, coming from the same conferences, Gonzaga, the West Coast Conference, something like that. Uh, they're, they're a pretty good team, but you don't really know what you're going to get from them all the time. They're kind of inconsistent. And I, I just like VCU as a whole, a lot of good athletes. So I think those are three games that could easily yeah, be upset. I'll throw one more in there also. Uh, Wichita State against Dayton. I wouldn't be surprised if Wichita, Wichita State upsets State. I agree with that, that one. It's a good pick. Yeah, huh? I agree. My list, I kind of went with some more like deeper runs, not really first-round games because usually they win and they lose in the next no, I round. I went with first-rounders. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways, I went with SMU, the six. I think they could make a run going down the line. I think they could end up beating Baylor because uh, Baylor just looked really weak down the stretch. And then I think my boys, the Butler Bulldogs, they could pull off a big win over UNC because they are, I think, 6-0 and against top 25 teams this season. And that's big news, and that could help them make a run. So do you guys have any dark horse teams that you could see winning it all? Uh, I, I could see West Virginia as a four seed winning it all. Uh, they looked really good at the beginning of the season. They had, some, they had some troubling stretches, definitely. They faltered a little bit coming into the tournament. But I, I still see them as a team that can at least, at, at least get to the lead eight, if not final four. Hey, Matt? My dark horse is, is pretty dark, but we're going with eight-seeded Wisconsin here. That is dark. Now, it's very possible that they could lose first round to Virginia Tech, but at the same time, I also think that they could make a deep run in this tournament. They have a lot of talent. You look at Nigel Hayes, Bronson Koenig, Ethan Happ. That's a very elite trio right there in terms of college basketball. That's uh, one of the best Who, who would they the play? Uh, what one seed would they play in the second round? Uh, it'd be Villanova. Okay. So that's obviously not a tough game. Number one, or, uh, obviously is a tough game. They might have to go the through Duke also. The overall seed in the whole tournament, but... I'm just saying, if you want, I, I tried to be really sort of out of the box with this one. But, and uh, I just I like Wisconsin as a team. I think they're very talented. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to stick with my SMU guys. Uh, I, look, I think they could beat uh, Baylor, and then uh, down the line they could beat Duke. And then if Matt was right and Wisconsin got over Villanova, I just don't think this is the tough – I don't think the East is the toughest uh, region to make it out of. They got that guy, Ojale, from SMU. He averages like 18 points a game. He's pretty big news. And I think SMU could make a run. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to the NBA. So the Celtics have continued to play well. But Isaiah Thomas, the point guard, they call him IT. He's been out a couple games because of a knee injury. Do you think it is was smart to sit him uh, because of that injury? Yeah. Uh, I think he suffered it yesterday. Uh, he, had, he still had a solid game uh, against blanking on who they played yesterday. Minnesota. Um, but, yeah, they're playing the, the 76ers, the New York Knicks, uh, next, two, next two games. They're both teams that are not going to be doing anything in the postseason at all. So I think the Celtics will be just fine without them. Marcus Smart, Terry Rozier, great po backup point guards. And this is a good time for, uh, to sit him and give him some rest. Matt? I just think there's no point in risking it, you know? I mean, yeah. why play him if, it's only, if it could only get worse? Uh, these are two teams that are beatable without him. And I'd just much rather even lose these two games than lose him potentially for the rest of the season or for just a long duration of time at all. So, good move. Yeah, that makes sense. I'd have to agree. No reason to lose your best player for the playoffs. 
And so, seven game series. Who do you have winning? Warriors, Spurs. I'm gonna give the edge to the San Antonio Spurs at this point. You know, the <coughs> Warriors, they've obviously got the most talented roster in the league. They don't have Kevin Durant right now, but Kawhi Leonard's been on another level this year. He's been unbelievable. Greg Popovich, I would say his best coach in the NBA, and I, it's really hard to argue anybody else. But uh, or with that being said, obviously the Warriors, it's, I think it would be a seven-game series either way. And I think the Spurs just have the edge because Kawhi Leonard's the best defensive, play, uh, defensive player. You know, I don't know if he'd be the best, I'd say best, at least best defensive uh, small forward in the league. Matt? I'm going with the dubs because just – it's, a, it's the easy pick. It is the easy pick. Uh, it is. Colin brought up some good points, and he made a good argument, but at the same time, I mean, it's just, you look at the roster, top five is pretty incredible. And I just don't think there's a way to conceivably shut them all down at once. You just got to pray, basically. And uh, I imagine what Western Conference Finals is probably going to look like this. It would be a very entertaining series, Should be, to say the if least. This does happen. Yeah, I agree uh, with Matt. I'm going to have to go with the Warriors. I just don't know how you stop Steph Curry. Uh, that's my that's my thing. Steph Curry, he's the, he's the small guy that's the big guy. He just shoots and the shoots. The little and big shoots. man. Yep. Heck yeah. So, LeBron James on the Cavaliers, small forward. Kind of does it all, though. Where do you have him on your all-time greatest NBA player list? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I got him at second, and I'm kind of kind of influencing that, that he's going to at least win one more title um, because that's just the rate he's going at. I guess if we're talking about now, maybe I'd give an edge to a guy like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Wilt Chamberlain. But I think by the end of the, by the end of this season, <laughs> if not next season, they're going to win another title. And LeBron James has just been – Unbelievable since he came out of high school, and he's he's been basically what Jordan was during the 90s. I would say to a little bit lesser extent, he's a, he's a little more uh, well, I guess like a little more well-rounded than Jordan. He's a little bit better defender, but uh, I'd still give the edge to Jordan, considering he's Michael Jordan. He won six rings, and he just dominated the NBA when he played. He probably could have had more if he played longer, but LeBron, I'd definitely put him at number two. Interesting, Matt. I really don't like ranking players before they retire because you know, they're not done. Especially a guy like LeBron who's only like, what, 32? So he's probably got at least another six years in him or so. But that being said, I'd probably put him in my top five somewhere. I think he's neck and neck with Bird, if not better, if not ahead of him for the best small forward of all time. And I could conceivably see him being considered the greatest player of all time when he's done. Depends on how many... How much? How many more championships he wins? How, wins? How many? How much longer he can stay at the top of his game? I mean, I don't think we've ever seen a player like him in the history of the league. And I think if somebody has the potential to topple Jordan, it's him. It's always tough, also, to rank. And I feel like NBA players the hardest to rank out of all the big Very four difficult. sports because just how different the game has been since when Bill Russell played in the '60s compared to now with guys like Durant, Curry, LeBron. I think it's just so hard to rank. People. Yeah, I agree. It's hard. I'm going to put him at the number two behind Michael Jordan. I think he's obviously been great, and I think he, like Matt said, is probably the only player who could pass Jordan as number one currently. I mean, maybe you never know. In like 40 years, you could have some guy named John Michaels who could go out and uh, be number one. But John Michaels. John Michaels. Call it now when ready. you are in your mid-50s. John Michaels, we're ready for you, bud. Where's he going to college? He's going to go to Kentucky. Butler. No, he's going to go to Kentucky. He's going to go for two years. Then he's going to hop into the NBA and, whew, seven-time MVP, seven-time champion. But six of those years when he wins the MVP, they win the championship one year. He's out for the first three quarters of the year, and then they go on and win. Calling it now. I see wow. the future. Not predicting doom John on him. John Michaels, though. can't wait to see you, bud. All right. So now we're going to really switch gears, just totally out of basketball, and we're going to hop on over to the NFL. we got Brandon Cooks, the wide receiver who used to be on the Saints. He's been traded to the New England Patriots, and they didn't even have to give up Malcolm Butler. Colin, your thoughts on that? I think that's big news. Yeah, I think it's a great move for New England. Uh, it gives him another weapon, for, or gives Tom Brady another weapon. Uh, Cooks, I think, had about 1,200 receiving yards with Drew Brees as his quarterback, so he's... He knows how to catch passes from talented quarterbacks like that. That's so I think it's going to be a perfect fit for the Patriots and Brandon Cooks. I agree. Should be a very good. Should end up being a very good move for them. I'm a little worried about Brady with deep ball receivers because he hasn't always succeeded with those kind of guys, hasn't always connected with them. But, I mean, he's Tom Brady, so I'm sure he'll find a way. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's a big move. And not having to give up Malcolm Butler is huge. I mean, I don't know if they're going to be able to re-sign him. 
Yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. Be yeah. But uh, he doesn't if, seem to want to come back. No. But I think that's big that they didn't have to trade him. So. Yeah. They might be able to get something out of him if it ends up being that trade. See, they'll see if they can get a maybe a second round pick. I don't think they're going to get that 12 pick from New Orleans because I don't think they. I think New Orleans thinks that's a bit of a high price. Yeah. Is it that, 11? Because the Browns are at 12. Oh, yeah. That's right. 11. Uh, and I think it's. Or, I think if he doesn't sign his tender, then uh, they could, or if he signs his tender, they could trade him without having to give up that first round pick. So, I think so too. Yeah. And so uh, across the NFL, moving kind of across the country, we're going to look at Eddie Lacy, who just signed with the Seattle Seahawks. He used to be a huge <laughs> fat guy for the Packers. He Still lost some fat, weight. Yeah. Now he's gaining some weight again. Good not, for him. Not looking good for Eddie. But uh, will he be a good fit in Seattle? I mean, it, it helps that you got Russell Wilson, a very talented <coughs> quarterback, but I don't think he's going to be as great as people expect him to. I, people have these lofty expectations from, like, his next Marshawn Lynch. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. Yeah, probably not. I mean, we've seen what he's capable of doing when he's in shape with the Packers. He was an excellent running back a couple years ago, probably regarded as one of the best up-and-coming backs in the league at that point. And then he gained, like, 40 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I think if he can get back to reasonable playing shape like he was before, then I think he's got the potential to make some waves. But if he's if he can't do that, then just no shot. It was a lack of run game that really screwed the Packers in the playoffs last year. So if he if and he was pathetic defense, yeah, that that as well. Uh, I mean, they looked awful against the Falcons. But I think if they had the run game that Lacey had a couple of years ago, it would have been a lot different for mm-hmm. Green Bay. I agree. I think that uh, Eddie Lacy's just kind of fallen off a cliff and he's going to have to try to climb back up and if he can do it in Seattle that'll be big because Seattle could really use a good running game. Uh, which wide receiver that switched teams this offseason so you got Brandon Cooks, you got Pierre Garçon, Deshaun Jackson, Terrell Pryor, you got a lot of guys. Who do you, uh, Alshon Jeffrey, who do you think will have the best season in 2017? Uh, we'll start with Matt this time. Going with Alshon. He's betting on himself, taking a one year deal with Philly and he's a supremely talented receiver as long as he can Stay on the field. He had that PED suspension last year. Should be fine. He's got a decent up-and-coming quarterback with Carson Wentz. I think he's got a high ceiling. Uh, No real great options around him, so he's clearly their number one. I think Jordan Matthews will be better as a number two like he was back when they had uh, Macklin a couple years ago, and Matthews was good as a rookie. I think we'll we'll see more of that. Uh, So, yeah, I think Alshon Jeffrey, one of the best receivers in the game, Coming off a bit of a down year, should be motivated to prove himself again to the NFL and get a big contract after the season. So I think he'll be the one. Uh, I'm going to give Jeffrey the edge to probably a close second would be Marshall as well as Terrell Pryor. I think all these guys in the NFC East, they've got quarterbacks either, in the case of Wentz, who started out well last year and kind of faltered, but he still looks promising. you got a guy who proved him to, who's proven himself in some seasons, Eli Manning. Obviously, he's a model inconsistency. And also another pretty inconsistent quarterback, Kirk Cousins. But uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what situation Cousins will be when he's playing for the Redskins next year. But I think Pryor would help him big time. Uh, Marshall (laughs) makes the Giants that much better. But I'll give the edge to Jeffrey because it gives Wentz an actual weapon to throw to. Yeah, I'm actually going to agree with you guys that uh, like Marshall Jeffrey. And then I think Terrell Pryor with the Redskins. He's coming to a team and he finally has an actual quarterback that isn't himself because he used to be a quarterback. Right. But, uh, I mean, he was with the Browns last year. They had like 12 quarterbacks. It was pathetic, pretty disgusting. Kirk Cousins is, when he's on, he's on. He's a good quarterback. And uh, he's going to be the number one wide receiver besides Jordan Reed, who's the tight end. So I think that's going to be big news. Uh, anyway. Bring up Major League Baseball, the MLB. Rick Porcello named opening day starter. Do you agree with that? I think you have to give it to him. I mean, guy won the Cy Young last year. I, opening day rotations don't really matter after opening day. So it's really just, uh, what's the word? I guess, I don't want to say symbolic, but I can't really think of the other word to ceremonial? describe it. Yeah, sure, we could go with something like that. It's just more of a ceremonial thing, you know. It's not, it's not really indicative of anything that important. Yeah, and I don't think... Uh, Chris Sale's going to be too hurt about this, no. considering that he, he he's going to be the number two to the Cy Young Award winner last year. Dude, Chris Sale's loving life, yeah. man. You've seen what he's been saying to the press recently? Yeah. I like it. Yeah, so uh, he, he seems happy. The Red Sox seem happy. I mean, David Price obviously is going to be starting uh, the year on, on the DEL, but, I mean, there's no reason to rush him back if you got this much talent in your rotation. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so then we're going to switch gears to NASCAR. We just keep on switching. We got Martin Truex Jr. finally winning his first race of the season here in Las Vegas. Uh, 
but we had a nice big fight at the end between Joey Logano and Kyle Busch. Colin, Matt's not going to want to give any yep. thoughts, so why don't you well, tell uh, your thoughts? Uh, on the race itself, it was pretty boring, most of it. I, I, did, I didn't tune in for the whole As thing. Always, typically uh, but they are quite boring. Saw, saw a lot of the last segment, um, and... It looked like it was Brad Keselowski's race to win, and then all of a sudden he had, a, I think it was a braking issue or something on, with two laps to go. Truex took advantage, and then w while he was dropping back, uh, it caused some problems between Logano and Kyle Busch. Yeah. Uh, I think that Kyle Busch had a right to be upset because Logano kind of overreacted in the situation. But at the same time, Kyle Busch has been known to be kind of a whiner when it comes to situations yeah, like that. Cry baby. So uh, I, I kind of see both sides of the story, and I think no punishment was the right call. Yeah, I'm going to agree. No punishment. Uh, we'll just see what ha kind of plays out on the track. One of them might try to get back to the other one. It'll probably be Kyle Busch because he likes to just cause fights on the racetrack. And so that's going to be other. Also, in terms of racing, the Iditarod is finishing right. up. We finally have a winner in Mitch Seavey. Six. For the past six years, either Mitch Seavey or his son, Dallas Seavey, have won. That's pretty boring. In my 11 years of watching the Iditarod, we've only had three winners. Or, sorry, we've had four, but... Two of the same last names. Doesn't really count. Oh, you're upset with uh, Jeff King? Yes, he came in 11th. His first, besides the races that he scratched out of, it is his first not top 10 finish in like 20 years. So, pretty depressing stuff. But he'll be back out there next year, maybe. I don't know. He's like going to be like 62. So, that is all here today on Spartan Center. I'm Patrick Varhue alongside Colin Casey. Alongside Colin Casey, on the other side of him, is Matt Rodalakis. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>